Okay, so as you remember that in this chapter, I did the first two parts when we were starting the consolidation. So before starting consolidation, I spent some time, 10, 15, 20 minutes on these two statements. And I explained to you first of all, the basic concept of financial position and profit or loss, right? So these first two are basically done. The, these are very similar to the consolidated ones, but I spent separate time on this and separate time on the consolidated ones. We don't have to merge okay. them okay? because these ones are the separate. Mm -hmm. And uh, already you have the notes for these as well, for these two, first two, okay? Now mm -hmm. we are going to start from this third one. So these four things we have to do today because these are the things that were remaining. So this is the whole financial position, which was done. And over here, here's the whole profit or loss, which was done as well. We are starting from here. This is basically profit or loss, the same thing as above, but only the other thing over here is other comprehensive income, okay? so. Let's read it from here. Let's start reading it from here. This is simply an extension to the statement of profit or loss. So again, it's kind of like an extended profit or loss statement. It just has one or two more lines. The reason for this is that some gains made by the entity during the year are not realized gains. Remember, we studied about unrealized, uh, unrealized gains. The example of this is the revaluation reserve. Whenever the asset values goes up, right? It is in imaginary terms, not in actual mm -hmm. terms. The main example is the revaluation of tangible non-current assets, which we have already studied. The gain is not realized until the asset is sold and converted into cash. Yes, that's correct as well. The revaluation represents a hypothetical gain, which is basically just like an imaginary amount, right? So this way, what we do is that this is the normal profit or loss, same as the above one, right? This is the normal one. And we only add one more part to this, and that is basically known as other comprehensive income. So it is just explaining that we just have a revaluation reserve that we just have to add below the statement of profit or loss, right? Mm -hmm. Now, these two things are separate. It's the other one's comprehensive income. The OCI part is made separate and the profit or loss part is separate. They are just, you know, showed together just to make it easier for the shareholder to understand. Okay. So you can see there is fortunately only one thing over here. So gain or loss on property or a revaluation in the year. That is revaluation gain. It can be a loss as well, but loss is actually not tested at this level. Okay. So mainly you will be given with the revaluation gain. Again, you just have to understand it like this, that this uh, statements, these will never be asked to you in the question, like to make the full statements or do you know, start typing the whole statements information. Or even in the, in the section B. Yeah, exactly. In the section B, they'll not be asked you, uh, they'll not ask you to make the whole statements. But yes, what can happen is that especially the consolidation one, first of all, these individual ones will not come in section B. Because I told you on the first day as well, that in section B, either consolidation and the second question will be either from ratios or from cash flow, right? So this is just for understanding purpose and just for making okay. a good base for the consolidation. Okay, so in other comprehensive income, there's only the revaluation reserve. And when we add these amounts together, this one as this one, we get the total comprehensive income. Okay, right. Now, this is the same thing that explained that these are two separate things. We don't have to combine them. Okay. So OCI is different and profit or loss is different. They are just combined to give a uh, overall figure, a uh, good presentation to the shareholder. Okay, right. Now, let's move forward. Let's see what is uh, what else is discussed over here. We have to come to the main topics. Those are the two main standards. Those are discussed over here. Those are not very long, very short and easy to understand. Now, this is basically the relationship between profit or loss and financial position. So what is the relation between these two financial statements? As you can see, it's very easy. Uh, one thing we already know for sure, and that is that financial position uh, contains all the closing balances, right? There is nothing opening coming over there. Right. So you can see that once we uh, take kind of the opening balances, we add profit or loss, other, you know, adjustments and like cash that is in out from the shareholders. This is basically the capital. Right. So when we add up these amounts or minus these amounts, we finally get up to the financial position. This is not much, you know, explanatory. Uh, I don't think this is much related to this part, but still uh, financial position has its separate format and profit or loss has its separate format. This is just telling what is the relation between them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, this is the new statement. This one, the statement of changes in equity. We are going to start it right now. 
Okay. Now, equity represents the owner's interest in the company. So in short, we can say that equity is capital and capital is anything which is invested into the company by the owner, right? So an alternative way of defining it is that it represents what is left in the business. When it ceases to trade, all the assets are sold off and liabilities are paid. Uh, this can be distributed to the equity holders, that is ordinary shareholders. Okay, so this is what is the statement of changes in equity is telling us, as you can see from the name that this is basically a statement, which outlines that what has been the change in the capital figure. So capital figure contains four amounts mainly, right? Like let's say share capital, share premium, revaluation reserve, retained earnings, right? These are the things that are written in equity. So it just tells us the change that during the year, what changed, either it will be added, it either it will be subtracted, right? So the movement it's, it is telling over here. Equity comprises, again, it's, it's telling the same thing, share capital, share premium reserves, right? Reserves contain revaluation surplus and uh, retained earnings, okay? Now revaluation surplus, we have already looked at this in very much detail. So whenever an, a tangible non-current asset goes up in value, in the market value, the gain we record in the financial statements. The gain is not realized, yes, that we know as well. So cannot be included in the retained earnings. Why is it not included in retained earnings? Because we actually don't have the actual physical cash of the gain, right? It it will be only realized, it will be only become it will only become physical cash when we actually sold that asset. Right. However, gain would still part from uh, still form part of the value uh, repaid to the equity holders if the business was sold off. So what it's telling over here is that this, I'm explaining this line's meaning that what does it mean by, you know, distributing it to the equity shareholder, you know, capital means assets minus liability, right? So any kind of excess assets that are remaining after deducting all the liabilities that is still remaining over here, this is then distributed to the shareholders because at, at the end of the day, the shareholders are owning the company, right? Because they are the ones who are providing finance. So that's why the assets that are left, that's why it is called net assets as well. Like we studied it yesterday as well, right? That's why it is distributed between shareholders. Now retained earnings is also very similar. This represents the total sum of the profits and losses made by the business since its incorporation and that not yet has been paid uh, to the shareholder as a dividend. So dividends we also deduct from the retained earnings. Now you can see the main thing over here. This is the format of statement of changes in equity. Again, if you want to draw it, you can, but uh, I would suggest just understand it. Just understand the structure of it, right? Because again, this will not be asked to you, like, uh, please draw a statement of changes in equity, like what things are included. You just need to know what actually things over here are included. It will never ask you to you know, make it or construct it. So you can see it's very, very simple. Uh, in equity, I told you there are four main elements, right? First is share capital, then we have share premium, then revaluation is there, then retained earnings, right? Now, what we do is that over here, you can see this is basically the opening balance. So everything will have an opening balance, all four of the figures, right? Then equity shares issued. This is the second thing that we write. So this tells us that during the year, how much equity shares are there that we issued to the shareholders, right? So this comes over here. There will be some capital amount as well. There be there will be some premium amount as well. Okay. And after that, revaluation surplus. Revaluation surplus, we also know this, that any kind of increase in the value of asset is written where? Only in this figure, in revaluation. Because obviously it's not part of shares, right? It will be written under revaluation surplus. And then afterwards, we write the net profit. Net profit goes on to which figure? Retained earnings. Because retained earnings are the earnings basically the profit or loss that has been retained from previous years right and finally we write the dividends over here as well the dividends what we do is we just deduct them we subtract them from retained earnings because they are only paid out from retained earnings no other reserve okay so this is how simple the statement of changes in equities there is nothing to understand over here just you need to remember that what things are written in this case and obviously we have a total column as well so this is optional, but if you make it, it just, um, you know, makes the presentation much better. Okay, right. So this is again, uh, explaining all the changes, the movement in the capital in the equity section that happened in the last 12 months in the whole year. Okay, right.
now and obviously uh, finally it has a closing balance over here that is total load after uh, you know adjusting and netting off each other okay now we have the next thing which is disclosure notes this is also very uh, important because if you remember when we studied the major accounting standards like the inventory one like the intangible assets like the non current assets we in the end of the chapter at the end of the chapter there were some topics which were related to the disclosure notes like what is the actual need of disclosing about this to the shareholder so it's also discussing over here so disclosure notes are required for variety of reasons including to explain the accounting policies used in preparing the accounts to explain the movement between opening and closing balances because shareholders need to know all these points right these are the questions that shareholders think in their mind right and company needs to provide them an answer in a form of statements of uh, financial statements okay to show how certain balances are calculated like if there is a new accounting standard that is adopted and uh, let's say the company is adopting for first time we need to tell the shareholders clearly that how this is calculated and then to provide further detail explanation to users of financial statements as necessary for the accounts to be understandable to the users because this is the main uh, you can say purpose of the company to basically explain the user of financial statements what it actually means because every user every shareholder will not be an accountant right the same thing as incomplete records they may not be accounting literate to know everything about accounting so that's why it's very it's a huge responsibility is on the company to make the information in the financial statements as easier as possible okay now this has some individual requirements this chapter we have already looked at right like provisions non current assets intangible assets right events after reporting uh, period this chapter will be looking at this one as well and inventory so all of these have their separate disclosure requirements which we have already looked at in the past okay now uh, this is explaining that you know preparation of financial statements and exam uh you know that in the exam these don't come these never come right i don't know why this has created like long examples there is no need to do them because we just need to understand the format in the exam these never come but yes in the next exam which is f7 which is a financial reporting exam you will have like a proper structured uh, microsoft excel question in which you will have to make the financial statement in, in the next exams mm -hmm. i mean I will, I will um, find things that I have already like done in F two and F three. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So for F two, you Could will you find them. Would be like easier for me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because that's why these papers are designed, right? These exams. F three is kept before F seven, and that's the main reason. Because we need okay. to, you know, create a basic financial accounting basics. if you are uh, uh -huh. clear about the basics then you can go on to f7 so i would say like many of the things are on f7 level because it's still financial accounting right it does not change yeah. the basics are same double entries all of these things but yes there will be some advancements like new accounting standards and the consolidation over here is just of one company right one parent one subsidiary in f7 it may be like 2 3 4 so oh just increasing okay. but still the treatment over there is same okay now this is a long example of this financial statement there is i don't think there is a need to do this okay there is a whole solution of this as well let's move on to the two things that were left and the most important things over here that was first of all the events after reporting period that is called is 10 as you can see over here so these are the two accounting standards they are very mini accounting standards very short right that's why they are included in this chapter because they belong to the financial statements preparation okay first of all let's do this one this is called is 10 international accounting standard 10 and it's known as events after reporting period so reporting period you know what is reporting period it's basically the year end right let's say 31st december is a year end and reporting period means that we have to report the financial statements after that in any case right so is 10 defines events after the reporting period as so this is the definition of this right those events favorable and unfavorable that occur between end of reporting period and the date when the financial statements are authorized for issue now this way we will not understand with the definition let me draw a small diagram over here 
this way you will be more comfortable in learning this definition okay let's say this is 31st december this is the year end right and let's say this is the year start 1st january right so this is the whole year for the uh, operations right and let's say this is the year end so we have to finish the financial statements over here right because the financial statements will be for these past 12 months for this past year right now let's say there is some period after this because what happens in real life is you will get to know this in uh, specifically in that paper it's called f8 uh, the audit and assurance paper the exam after the f7 one right so what happens is that uh, once the financial statements are finalized they are made right there is there are basically two periods as you can see one is known as reporting period and this is the reporting period right this is the year end in short terms right now the second period over here is financial statements authorized date right let's say that uh, let's say on 3rd or 4th march these financial statements get authorized now let me explain you what this means so authorization means that whenever audit takes place you will understand this when you will study the paper of it so audit is basically when independent accountants independent qualified auditors accountants come into the business they are not related to the company in any case they don't know anyone they don't have a friend or family in that company they are completely independent people right so they come into the company they have an independent point of view and they their main aim is to check the financial statements if the company has done something wrong if the company has you know done something fraudulent if there is anything fishy about the company right so that means auditor's main responsibility is to check that right now what happens is that this is 10 is there to explain these events like the line which i'm making over here so these events occur it's written in the definition as well between the reporting period and the authorization date right so what is the difference in between these two so auditors basically take let's say two or three months in uh, in specific terms we can say if we take an average in many companies they take in some companies they take one month in some some companies they take two months the companies which are very big which are listed companies they may even take three or four months right but let's take an example they are usually done by checking their financial statements in the month of march if the year end is 31st december right so they take two or three months easily they check and after that they submit their report because it's kind of an independent report auditors are trusted all over the world they are the most trusted people among the accountants because they are responsible for checking the financial statements right so that's why this is the authorization date authorization date means that on which date the auditors approve the financial statements they made a big tick on them right they did not make a cross they make a tick so that they verify that financial statements yes they are correct there is no fraud involved in this there is no fraudulent activity the company has reported correct figures so this is called the authorization date right so i hope you understand that reporting date and authorization date these two are different now this is 10 talks about again the events that happen in between these dates between reporting period and authorized date right so let's say there was uh, like in the whole year this year in the whole 12 months there was let's say uh, a litigation uh, case against the company a court case running against the company right they it may be uh, you know filed by a customer or anyone who did wrong with the company right so this is one example but there are many kind of examples right now there are two kind of events the detail we are studying right over here there are two kind of events first is known as adjusting event second is known as non adjusting event okay now each and every one uh, each and everything over here has a separate explanation let's start discussing first of all the adjusting events okay now adjusting event is very easy to understand the definition over here you can see they provide additional evidence of conditions existing at the reporting date in simple terms you can just remember it as the adjusting events are those events whose condition exists at the year end let me give you a small example okay let's take an example of receivable you know receivables are our customer right and they trade very much in these 12 months let's say they trade every day with us they purchase items every day every month every week right so receivables are one thing which we can call these are adjusting right because let's say 
we're talking about events specifically over here right events means anything which is unfavorable or favorable both you can understand it's written over here right so favorable means that is good for the company unfavorable means that is bad for the company right let's say there was a receivable that was due at the year end at 31st december but unfortunately let's say at 1st february the next year at 1st february the receivable announced let's say it was a huge balance like 3 4 5 million dollars on 1st february this receivable said that i am going bankrupt i cannot pay you sorry right so now everyone will be sad in the company everyone will be shocked everyone will be surprised right that such huge sum will not be received by the company let's say it was 70% of the revenue of the company right so this is an event which happened between these dates one thing is confirmed right because events after reporting period is 10 needs to be within this date right not after this not before this within these dates only mm -hmm. within the reporting period and the authorization date right now this means that receivable did exist at the year end right that means he may purchase goods from us let's say on 1st october or even before that but the thing is the crux of this is he was the concession did exist at the 12 months right he was a customer in the previous year of us right so that means this is definitely an adjusting event because his condition existed at the year end at the reporting date right so for adjusting events there are a lot of examples as well i'll discuss them in just a while this was just fun example what do we have to do we have to adjust the financial statements to reflect the event right now what we'll do is we'll actually post a double entry and that double entry will be debit bad debt right which is 5 million dollars and credit receivables that is 5 million dollars this is in short the double entry for bad debt if you remember right so that yeah. means every kind of adjusting event will need some kind of a adjustment a proper adjustment in the financial statements and this thing obviously auditors will also know because we will have told them it's not a small thing right like losing 5 million dollars in just one minute right so auditors will also you know take account of this and they will have to include this in the financial statements as well right this is the reason why we are comparing only the events that are happening between these two dates not in the other dates because so that auditor is aware of that whatever happens in between these dates okay so this was one example of adjusting now let's discuss non adjusting as well and then we'll move towards the example that are written in the study text okay now non adjusting let's look at this so in non adjusting what happens is certain conditions which did not exist at the reporting date so obviously it is completely opposite to the adjusting one in adjusting what did we study that the condition of that item existed at the year right but in non adjusting the condition unfortunately does not exist right let's say there was kind of uh, let's say like an earthquake right like a tsunami like an earthquake a natural disaster that occurred again on 1st february so we did not know at the year end right that this tsunami will occur it was not planned right it was sudden and unfortunate right yeah. did we know this at the last year end no we did not so that means this is a perfect example for non adjusting event right now for non adjusting we have two treatments over here it depends upon a condition right let's see so here the word is impact going concern first of all let me explain you what going concern is because this is very important as well it's just a one or two minute discussion so the word is going concern right now this is an accounting concept like just we studied accrual concept prudence concept matching concept right all of these duality concept separate entity concept right all of these concepts so this is also a uh, accounting concept which is going concern now this basically the definition for this is let me write the definition first so ability of the business ability of the business to operate for next 12 months okay this is a universal definition for this and the easiest to understand okay so what is going concern the ability of the business to operate for 12 months again this is we can say an assumption it's a accounting concept as well but it's an assumption and it's a very major assumption it plays a very major role in the financial accounting world 
right now this assumption can have two effects it can be valid and it can be not valid right now let's take an example let's take a short example let's say this covid 19 came right if i talk about my country in pakistan it came i think in it went severe in let's say march 2020 right in april 2020 it was at very high peaks right it was running very high so in april 2020 let's say if one company started its new year on 1st january 2020 right and it said with, with its employees and its managers huge meetings took place the businesses said that we'll have very good year we'll prosper we'll achieve very good sales right all of this that the company do on the new years right when the new financial year starts so at the start of the year they were assuming that their going concern assumption would be valid because they would be able to operate for the next 12 months they did not know right that this uh COVID-19 would come after just four months in April and May, right? So let's say if COVID-19 came and it shut down most of the businesses because businesses had cash shortage and all over the world this happened, right? Like cash shortage was a very severe one with all the businesses. So business had to make their assumption not valid because of this circumstance that COVID-19 came. They automatically had to shut off because there was no other option. Right? They were left with no other option. So that means this is one example of going concern. Now in valid, what happens is that over here, the main term is 12 months, right? The ability to operate for the next 12 months. So in valid, what happens is the company creates normal financial statements and it include non-current items as well and current as well, because that's the reason non-current means that items which last more than 12 months, non-current assets as well, non-current liabilities as well. Right now, if the assumption is not valid in any case, in any part of the year, if the assumption is not valid, what we do is we create accounts on a breakup basis. Okay. So there is one basis, which is called breakup basis. And, and on that, basically what we do is that non-current items are just excluded from the financial statements. Non-current assets are never written. Non-current liabilities and assets, both things. Okay only thing which is written is the current items like current assets current liabilities only the capital items okay just give me one minute Okay, continuing. So non valid, I was talking about when the assumption is not valid, what happens is that financial statements are prepared on a breakup basis. Breakup basis means that only current items are included, right? There is no non current item. Obviously, there should not be right. It makes sense naturally as well. Because if the company not valid means that company will not operate for next 12 months, company will have, have to shut down the business. This means shut down in next 12 months within next 12 months we can say right so if they're shutting down within 12 months next 12 months everything will be converted to current in that case right so this is the meaning of going concern i hope you are clear about this to some extent because we just need to understand it to some extent because this is just relevant to the non-adjusting event it does not have a separate chapter okay now if this non-adjusting event if it is impacting the going concern, let's say there was a huge fire or a huge natural calamity, which destroyed the all of the inventory. Now we did not know that fire or natural calamity will occur or not, right? It's a non adjusting event, because its condition did not exist at year end. Right? So if it is impacting going concern, that means if it is impacting the 12 months assumption that we just looked at, so we have to adjust the financial statements to present onto the breakup basis. Again, it's talking about the same thing. If it is impacting the going concern assumption, like COVID-19 is also a non-adjusting event. One example, one specific example of non-adjusting event is this coronavirus, right? So this we did not know would come, right? It was not planned. It just came surprisingly and suddenly, right? So this made some businesses, they had no option but to create their valid into non-valid. The valid going concern assumption, they had to turn it to non-valid, 
right so in this basis obviously they had to make it on breakup basis that means they had to write all the current assets in the liabilities nothing non current so this is okay, the so it is, okay yeah, yeah. sorry if it is not adjusting so there is nothing that we need to adjust in the financial statement so there will be no going concern involved right basically yeah so in non adjusting the thing over here is that there are two effects it will depend upon two conditions so first thing was this impacting going concern right now if it does impact going concern we have to prepare it on breakup basis and that 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 the thing that you're talking about the non adjusting we don't have to adjust that i'm just coming back in just one minute and that is the second one okay so this second one we can see if it does not impact the going concern right let's say if there was a fire let's ignore the covid 19 let's say if there was a fire and that destroyed inventory right if it destroyed inventory no problem we have enough money we can purchase more inventory yes it was very sad it was very unfortunate but this happens in businesses we can purchase more more inventory we have to move on right so this is also a non adjusting event but this this inventory destroyed in fire this is non not adjusting sorry not affecting the going concern right because business will still operate for next 10 15 years it's just a small loss of let's say 500 600 thousand dollars right so what happens is that if it is not impacting going concern then do not adjust the financial statements what we have to do is we have to disclose by note if important to users understanding okay so again repeating just from the start what we do is if the event is adjusting now first thing remember event should occur between these two dates which was reporting date and the authorization date this period that i uh, draw over here okay now if this is adjusting if the event is adjusting we have to properly adjust the financial statements we have to properly post a proper double entry regarding that right but if the event is non adjusting that means if the condition is not existing at the year end like a sudden fire a sudden natural calamity right a sudden new customer a sudden new non current asset purchase if the event is non adjusting then what we have to do is it depends upon two things if it is impacting going concern then we make the uh, financial statements on break up basis right just the current account, uh, the current amounts right and if it is not impacting the going concern that means business will still operate for the next 12 months and even further as well right so if this is the case then we don't have to adjust anything we just have to write two or three paragraphs just to explain to the shareholder and that basically means just to disclose it by note we just have to disclose it to the shareholder so that it is brought into his or her knowledge because that's the main purpose over here okay, okay? right so again adjusting has one item non adjusting has two conditions upon those two conditions we have to act right now don't expect that you will uh, get a proper like question this is just you know for a safe side we just practice it on a safe side because in real life i've seen many teachers just skip this topic and that's actually bad because many questions are just on the theoretical things like what happens and adjusting event you might be asked on mcq but this will not be asked in section b it's a not not a long term question right it's okay. a, it's a very short concept and a very mini concept Okay, right. Got it. So this was adjusting and non-adjusting event, which was IES ten. Okay. Now let's read some of the example of adjusting events as well. Right. Now these are the example of adjusting event. Remember, adjusting events condition exist at year end. Let me write the full form. At year end. Okay. Now the first example is the settlement after the reporting date of a court case which confirms a year end obligation. now you can see that the court has given the verdict and we lost the case so now we have to pay the uh, damages to the customer right so the court case the thing the main keyword over here is court case right this one court case was existing at the year end right now this very court case has its verdict right now between those two dates right so it is a adjusting event because the condition existed and this decision is regarding that thing which condition existed at the year end right so this is adjusting even because this is not actually anything which we did not plan this was planned this was going on from the last 12 months right so this is adjusting even now secondly the receipt of information after the reporting date 
that indicates that asset was impaired at reporting date so impaired basically means impaired is the opposite to revaluation one word is revalued the other word is impaired impaired means decrease in market value right let's say let's say after the year end we got uh, a news that our asset went down from 500000 to 300000 so there was a 200000 devaluation loss you can say or in other words we can say impaired impairment that asset existed at the year end right it was producing mm-hmm. loss for us in the whole 12 months in the whole year so that means this is also adjusting right now mm-hmm. bankruptcy of a customer after reporting date that confirms that year end debt is irrecoverable same thing same example that i gave you above if a bad debt the bad debt the receivable will be existing at the year end right he will be a normal yeah, customer yeah. in the whole previous year so this is also an adjusting event right the bankruptcy of him after that sale of inventories after reporting period at a price lower than cost obviously inventory did exist at year end the whole year it was with us in the factory so if it is being sold at less price or let's say its nrv was less than cost we have to adjust the closing inventory this is also an adjusting event right so the list goes on and on just you have to remember this general rule that condition did exist at the year end okay right now let's talk about non adjusting events examples as well these are very simple as well now non adjusting events condition did not exist at year end right its condition did not existed it was just a sudden thing it was not planned right now announcing a plan to discontinue an operation yeah exactly this is also non adjusting event because look uh, a sudden plan to just discontinue one product or an operation or a department or let's say one store closing down closing down a store that is a non adjusting event because we did not know it beforehand we just made a sudden decision just after the year end right so this is also a non adjusting event now after that okay. major purchase of assets yes assets we also purchase because we need them now maybe we are not planning for them from the last 12 months because companies directors don't, don't have that much time that first they plan then they plan then they evaluate then they purchase they just you know obviously there everyone is rich over there so they just make the decision in just one second that they just purchase the assets if you need it then purchase this is also non adjusting event because this is anything which is not planned from the last year now destruction of assets after the reporting date by fire or flood right now if any kind of fire or flood occurred this is a non adjusting event as well because we did not know the natural calamity had occurred it is just from god we did not know it was not planned right it was just sudden surprising so it is also non adjusting event after that entering into significant commitments or contingent liabilities yes this can also be a non adjusting event because significant commitment means let's say um 31st december was the year end let's say on 15th january we got a deal done we got a contract done with a huge customer right and we let's say we had to provide him 100000 units which is a huge order so this also happened suddenly it was not planned right so all of these are examples of which events non adjusting events okay right so this was the explanation for this i hope you got it now let's move on to the next one let's see what else we have got let's do this example as well so that you uh, understand the concept okay so which okay. of the following are adjusting events for big company the year end is 30th june 16 this is important and accounts are approved that means the authorization date is which one 18th august 2016 right so that means approximately like one month and 18 days after that after the year end right so first of all uh, it's written sales of year end inventory on 2nd july 2016 at less than cost right so you can see that inventory did exist at the whole year end right it was existing at the previous year so that means this is adjusting event we will have to adjust this we will have to actually decrease the closing inventory because let's say its nrv was less than cost something happened some natural calamity happened right so this will be an adjusting event but the word over here is not natural calamity it's just less than cost because that inventory existed at the year end that's why it is adjusting event okay now second one the issue of new ordinary shares on 4 july 2016 so anything which happens suddenly like a new commitment 
new ordinary shares that are issued they did not have any condition at the year end right they were just given suddenly they were just sold suddenly that means this is a non adjusting event right sorry i'm sorry uh, i didn't understand why we don't adjust that uh, the second one or the first one yeah the second the second one. one right look actually what's happening is that new ordinary shares are sold out now was there any condition of you know selling or planning to sell the ordinary shares at the year end right it does not make sense that way so it's better to say that it's non adjusting because we just looked at one example as well as you can see non adjusting to issue new shares to purchase major assets these all kind of assets is just a sudden decision right so this thing actually did not have any kind of condition attached that's why it is a non adjusting event now a fire in the main warehouse occurred on 8 july 2016 so it's within the period right because the year end was 30th june and the accounts uh, authorization date was 18th august it's within yeah. this date right so all inventory was destroyed look what happened is the main keyword is a fire in the main warehouse did we know that fire would occur in the last year we did not know right so that means the condition of this did not exist look there are two words over here yes students can get confused in this like to take the inventory yeah. word or the fire word so whichever word is used first in the sentence that we have to take everything else we have to ignore right so what actually happened a fire occurred right yes inventory is damaged no doubt but fire occurred did we know that fire occurred fire will occur next year we did not know right so this also will be a non adjusting event covid 19 everything this is like a non adjusting event because it just suddenly happened it was out of our control right now a major credit customer was declared bankrupt on 10th july 16 obviously that credit customer will have existed during this whole previous year right prior to this 30th june so obviously this is an adjusting event because their customer will be a major customer purchasing and selling all of the year right now all of the share capital of a competitor tini company was acquired on 21st of july 2016 you see there is a new there is a sudden you know let's say this was like purchasing a subsidiary company right so this company which was this big company big company purchased tini company's share capital right so any kind of investment any kind of purchasing new asset this is also a non adjusting event because its condition did not exist at the year end right so it's also non adjusting now the last one is on 1st of august 16 500000 was received in respect of an insurance claim dated 13th of february 2016 so let's say this insurance accident occurred at this date which was 13th february right so this was existing at the year end right this condition did exist at 30th june because everyone in the company will know that yes this happened so that's why we summoned the uh, to the insurance company right so exactly this is also the adjusting event okay right so this is what we have to look that if the condition existed or did not exist so we have to just tell the adjusting one from these so 1 2 3 and 6 one second so sorry 1 2 4 and 6 yeah so 1 2 4 and 6 which is option b this will be the correct answer okay right